All right, well, good to be here again tonight and worship the Lord. <clears throat> the blood of Jesus. I like to, one of the first things I do when I get to a college campus is get to the place where they have a student union or where a lot of people are moving about and I just stand up and say, or sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. exciting thing to to set uh, to set the throne of heaven right there in the midst of a wicked place and just to start praising God in the midst of a bunch of people that curse him on a regular basis and and open up his word and and bring God right into the darkness <clears throat> that's what Jesus meant when he said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. The world's a dark place, but I want you to go in there and, and take me right down, right down into the darkness. And those that sit, that says there in, I think, Matthew, those that sit in the, in the edge of death and uh, uh, take my light to the, to the darkness and, and let my light shine in the midst. It's exciting. It's exciting. I would encourage you all. It's exciting. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, the Israelites, they didn't believe in an exciting life and they came to the banks of the Jordan. They didn't realize how wonderful it was gonna be on the other side there when Joshua was gonna take them in. And um, <clears throat> oh, I, I think of those giants and how they looked out there and said, my, we're gonna be eaten up and this is, a, this is a bad place to go and we keep our women and children over here, you know, self-preservation. You know, God gave us a brain, didn't he? We had to think. <laughs> Let's stay on this side of the Jordan and uh, <clears throat> they, uh, they looked at the, at, the, at the fearful giants there and they said, we're not gonna go in. And the Lord was upset um, because they were looking in the wrong direction, were they not? And they should have been looking at him and uh, he's much bigger than those giants are, just like little David found out. Those giants aren't a problem. We can take them down. But one thing I wanna remind you and something that's really important to remember is that giant fruit that they brought back, you know, the spies, the spies brought back, that giant fruit is at the feet of the giants. And if you want some giant fruit, I mean, some of the real fruits of the Spirit, the joy unspeakable and full of glory and all the fruits that, that God has for you, those fruits, he's placed them in the promised land at the feet of giants. And if you're afraid of those giants, I got news for you, you're not gonna eat of that good fruit. You're gonna be like those Israelites that wandered in a circle for 40 years. 40 years. You know, a lot of Christians I've noticed over the years are just wandering in a circle. <laughs> you wonder, where are you, where are you going? They don't know where they're going. They've been saved for 20, 30 years, they still don't know where they're going. Wandering in a circle, purpose, purposeless. I don't wanna live that way. <clears throat> I wanna go across the Jordan and Face the giants. And so uh, let's do that. Let's, let's face giants. We just started a mission down in the inner city of Columbus. We, we uh, are gonna go down and take, take on giants. And we're starting here in a couple of weeks to take on the giants. And uh, there's giants down there. And, and uh, we, we started to have some meals down there just to get to know the people. And one young man, probably 20 years old, he looked at us and said, what are you guys doing in the hood? I said, we're down here to bring you Jesus in the hood. And uh, <clears throat> drugs are flowing all over the place. But that's where the giants are. And so let's take, let's take the gospel into uh, areas where the giants are. Well, <clears throat> I do want to just testify here. I, I, uh, I've been studying the scriptures and been preaching through the New Testament for many years. And I'm down to just two books left the book of Acts and 2 Corinthians. 
And I want to testify, especially to you young people here, that I have many times gone through the scriptures and studied and sat at my desk and just praised God because I said, Lord, this is the word of God. This is the word of God. I mean, when you get into this Bible and you study it and you look into it, you realize that no man could have ever written this book. This is the word of God. And I tell you, it gives you great confidence to to know that what you're teaching is truth. And uh, so I, I have great confidence here tonight when I'm teaching you the truth, because I've seen it many times. God, nobody can come up with this kind. And nobody can attach all these things together, and it's just you. (laughs) It's the wisdom of God. So young people, this is the word of God, and you know how to put your trust and faith in it here tonight. So let's, let's just look into the Bible. I feel sometimes overwhelmed. I I realize that I just have the responsibility here today to take a passage of the Bible and try to teach it to you, and, and we'll leave the, uh, the, uh, the uh, tailoring of the message to the Spirit of God as uh, the truth comes out, and I, I would love to be able to tailor it for everybody, but there's too many people here to tailor it, and so I, I just want to leave it to the Lord tonight to tailor these words for each one of your hearts and May you be open and let him do that as uh, he walks amongst us. So let's look in the Bible. Mark chapter 11. This evening, Mark chapter 11. I even got a title for this message tonight. And I've preached on this subject before and changed things a little bit. But for those of you who who like titles and those who take titles down. Uh, The title of the message is Sacred or Secular? Sacred or Secular? And I want to start reading here in Mark chapter number 11. Starting in verse number 11. Now, I'm under the persuasion as looking into the scriptures here that that the last days as we approach them and the return of Christ, there are very similar situations going on in the last days in the first coming of Christ when he he took upon himself the the form of uh, uh, a babe and he he was brought into this world. And so when you look at the nation of Israel, you see a lot of similarities to the last days that we're going to uh, enter into, Lord willing. And so um, let's start reading here in Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 11. It says, And Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And this is about the last day or two before he is going to enter in for the last time. And into the temple, and when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Let's have a word of prayer we, Lord, we acknowledge you tonight again and, and in our feebleness, and, and, uh, but we acknowledge your, your strength and your power and your might and, and your wisdom, Lord, and we acknowledge that you have written this book and that we have it and thank you for it. We acknowledge also that the word became flesh and people got to see the life of Jesus walked out on this earth. We acknowledge he is truly the son of God and the son of man and the savior of the world and so we come to you and we want to hear your voice and we want to uh, uh, understand more of you and your purposes and your will and so we pray your blessing Lord upon us 
Thank you for all that have come tonight and may the word of God edify and encourage and admonish all that are here. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, this is uh, nearly uh, the end of the ministry of, of the Lord and I think if you keep reading on here, the next day is his last time of uh, entering into Jerusalem and uh, he uh, is pronouncing judgment and he's giving the seven woes of Matthew chapter 23 to the religious leaders and pronouncing judgment upon them and he is also giving a prophecy uh, 30 or 40 years down the road of AD 70 when uh, Jerusalem, or the Roman army is going to come and he cries out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you'd have only known in the day of thy visitation uh, but the, the things that I had prepared for you, but, but you're, you're, you're going to be destroyed and every, uh, every stone of this temple is going to be cast down and he, he prophesies of an event that uh, is going to happen in about 30 or 40 years and many, many parables, and we don't have to go through them, describing judgment <clears throat> that is about to come on Israel for their rejection of the Messiah. And here we have a picture of that very judgment. We have a picture of this fig tree here in verse number 13 and on down in verse number 20 and 21. But, but Jesus approaches a fig tree and that fig tree represents Israel. It represents the uh, city of Jerusalem from the Old Testament there and, and the Lord is giving a picture. Not only does he, he speak into uh, Israel's judgment but he's also showing us by way of picture here with this fig tree and that the Lord comes to it and he, he, he's at a distance and he looks at the fig tree and he sees it and there's leaves on it. It looks like it has life. It looks like it's gonna have fruit, but he approaches the fig tree and as you know, he looks upon it, he's hungry and he finds no fruit on this fig tree. And, and it's a picture of the nation of Israel, how that the nation of Israel seemed to have a lot of activity. They had their Passovers and their feasts, and they uh, went into the temple and out, and they did a lot of religion, but they had not real fruit. Nothing that really satisfied the Lord. Nothing that pleased him. You know, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And unless we walk in the Spirit, and unless we... Uh, respond to the word of God in faith, we cannot please God. And many people today do a lot of religious things, but they're not in faith. They do a lot of religious things, but it's not being led and motivated by the Spirit. And uh, that's what was going on in Israel in, in these days. And Jesus made this comment of those uh, Israelites. He said, they worship me. They worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And so I think if you'd have been alive back in those days, you'd have seen a lot of worship, even like we did tonight, a lot of worship, a lot of singing, a lot of preaching, a lot of praying at the wailing wall there, a lot of praying perhaps, but, but the heart was far, uh, far from the Lord. And you know, God looks down from heaven and he wants to see some fruit. He wants to, uh, to take pleasure in hearts that, that love him and love his word and love his purposes and, and out of that wonderful heart comes praise and adoration and faith and worship and those things that, that please the Lord. <clears throat> and I think we need to remember that as churches, especially we as leaders, that, that God is looking for those things. He's looking for faith. He's looking for people to respond to him in faith. He's looking for people to respond being moved by the Holy Ghost. And the scripture says it's God which worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What really pleases him is that which is motivated from within, from the power of the Spirit of God. And I know we've, we have brethren today that are trying to perhaps motivate people through force and through, through regulation and through rules and through standard. And I don't, I don't think that's the way we ought to motivate God's people. God's people ought to come to him with a, with a free will offering, with a heart that says, Lord, I want to. 
I want to serve you, and Lord, I want to do these things. And you know, you can get people to, to obey and, and follow a certain teachings and certain regulations. You can do it by force. And I believe that Jews are very good at that. They put fear and, and uh, regulations upon individuals and, and basically cause them to say, listen, if we don't do this, we're gonna be put out of the community. So we better do it. And they did it, and you looked at it and said, it's really religious, it looks like it's a good thing, but you know, the Lord didn't get any pleasure out of it at all. Because it wasn't coming out of a free will expression, a desire to please the Lord from their heart. And God is interested in a free will offering. He has throughout the Old Testament uh, asked for, for people to bring him a free will offering. And so, so I'm always trying to encourage a free will offering. <laughs> I'm wanting people to say, preach the word of God and let God say to that heart, here's what you ought to do. And let that heart rise up and just follow the Lord and uh, respond by faith. <clears throat> Paul understood this here in 1 Corinthians 9. He says this, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. If I do this thing willingly, if it's in my heart and, and I'm being motivated from within by the Holy Spirit of God, I have a reward. And I think we get to heaven. You're going to find that God's going to reward you based upon how you responded to his his, his word by faith and how you also yielded yourself to the wooings and the movings of his spirit in your heart. And uh, I, I try to avoid putting the screws down on people. You know, Jesus led people. He didn't drive them. You drive cattle, but you lead sheep. Amen? And the Bible tells elders not to lord over God's people, but to lead them by example. And as I said last night, you know, Jesus would walk through the crowds and he would say, listen, if anybody wants to come and follow me, let him take up his cross and follow me. And he'd just start walking. And, and anybody want to come, free will, you come. Anybody doesn't want to come, you can stay there. And so he, he, uh, he was one who believed in, in, in a free will and, and offering a free will. And so 2 Corinthians 9, let me give you another verse. It says, every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. It's talking about giving here. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. God loves a giver who gives from the heart like, oh, I just want to give to the Lord. And the heart is just, Lord, I just want to give. You know, I did that way back. I remember the first time I gave that way. I was just a new Christian, and, and I was sitting in a Baptist church, and the preacher stood up, he preached about give, and it shall be given unto you. And I, in my simple faith, that's how I was converted, just by simple faith. I wasn't brought up as a, as a, in a Christian home or anything, and uh, I knew I was a sinner going to hell. One day, I was working at a golf shop. I walked over. The owner of the golf shop had put a, a, a bunch of gospel tracks out. He had just been converted himself. And so he put a bunch of gospel tracks out. I walked over. I was closing the shop that night, July 15th, 1978. I was under conviction, looking for answers. I walked over there, and here was a gospel track. And I picked it up, and I simply started to read it. And it talked about the Romans road, the plan of salvation. And I got down, I said, I could agree with everything, and I must have had a a respect for the word of God because I, I believed it. And I got down to the end of the track and it said in Romans 13, or Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. Because in my little heart, 19 year old kid, no Bible training at all, I thought whosoever, that means me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that was a promise that was speaking right to my heart. And I thought to myself, I, if I call upon Jesus right now, I'm going to be saved. Isn't that amazing? The simplicity of faith. 
I walked out of the door, closed the shop that night, got in my car and started crying and crying out to God saying, God, save me. And you know what? I knew that when I prayed and asked him to save me, he was going to save me. And you know what? He did. And that was nearly 40-some years ago. By faith. Well, I was telling you a story. I was sitting in the Baptist church. And by the way, people do, people do respond to God right sometimes in the Baptist church too. Amen? Yes. As a matter of fact, tr- truthfully, uh, I don't mean to be critical here, but I look at my life, the first 10 years in the Baptist church, I think I grew more in those 10 years than any other 10 years in my life. I mean, we, 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 uh, we really move forward, and uh, I move forward, but I was sitting there in the church, and he preached on give, and it shall be given unto you, and I had just gotten paid, probably got $300 a week, and I mean, honestly, I'm thinking simple faith. I'm going to put this whole thing right there in that offering when it comes by. I believe God. You know what I was thinking? Next day, I'd probably get a check in the mail for 1000 <laughs> And I gave it all. I just gave it all. I said, Lord, here it is. I mean, I I believe your word. And you know, the Lord didn't send me a check the next day for $1,000, but I'll tell you what, my life has been blessed and I've never lacked, amen? He's been very good and, and he's prospered. And so giving according to what is purposed in your heart, so let him give. That is a a free will offering. And you know, when the Lord came there to that fig tree, he was looking for hearts like that. Just, Lord, your word says this, and I'm gonna trust you and do it. Lord, uh, your spirit is moving in my heart, and I'm gonna just obey your spirit and walk it out. That's the kind of fruit he was looking for. But you know, in Israel, they were all under fear and oppression and and, and duty and regulation and, and everybody was, was uh, you know, we got to do this to stay in the community and, and uh, it was all rules and regulations. And there was no expression, a heartfelt expression of faith. And so it says every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Giving from the heart is fruit unto God. He loves a cheerful giver. I preached at my grandma's church. It was a friend's church many years ago. I was just a young preacher. I did a lot of stupid things back then. And, uh, but I was preaching, and, and I decided I'm, gonna, I'm preaching on this passage right here. God loves a cheerful giver. So I thought, I'm going to just show him what a cheerful giver is. Not just teach it, I'm going to be a cheerful giver. So I got $51 bills, put them in my wallet. I didn't have a lot of money back then. $51 bills, and it came time to showing them how to be a cheerful giver. I went out into the, the, the pews out there. There was probably only 50 or 60 people there. And I just started throwing money around and handing money out. And the kids were running for the money, and, and I gave $51 bills away. Well, I walked out that, that after, afterwards in preaching and I, they had an a, a, a offering plate there. And this offering plate, they said, we're going to give this to you. And it was piled with bills. And all those 50 came back. I think every parent said to the children, give that money back. Put that in the offering plate. But there were many other bills in the offering plate too. By the way, don't expect me to do that, il- that illustration here tonight. <clears throat> But see, God loves a cheerful giver. He loves to see our hearts just respond to the word of God. And tonight, you, you know, you want to please God? Just respond to the word of God. As the word of God is preached, or as the spirit of God leads you, then say, amen, yes, I'm going to respond to it. And that way, uh, you'll please the Lord. And so we don't try to force people into doing what they don't really. You know how with our children, son, take the garbage out. Oh, dad, I'd love to. I'd love to please you, dad. Doesn't that do something for your heart? But if your child says, all right, I'll do it if I have to. Doesn't do anything for you. Doesn't do anything for me. And so fruit, the Lord was looking for fruit There was an appearance there. It looked like there was going to be some fruit because there was a lot of green leaves, but there was no fruit, no heartfelt obedience there 
that he found on that tree. Now, what's, what, what, what is the Lord looking for? I shared with you some heartfelt obedience, but the Bible talks about fruit, doesn't it? Fruit. And uh, the fruit of the Spirit. The Lord is looking for that. So let's picture yourself tonight as a fig tree. And the Lord is walking, coming to you, and he's looking for some things in your life that he might partake of, that might give him pleasure. And so he's looking for these kind of things. Number one, he's looking for some love, some expression of love, not only to him, but also to your brother and sister, and also to the world out there, to love, to have an expression of love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. The fruit of the Spirit is peace, and you know all of them, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance. You ever notice that these fruits are all attitudes? They're all attitudes from the heart. You know, we don't pay a lot of attention, enough attention, I don't think, to these attitudes. We're a people that like convictions. And what should, you do this, you do this, you do this. You know, I'm a man of conviction. We don't celebrate Christmas. We don't have Christmas trees. And, and I have a King James Bible. And, and uh, we dress a certain way. And we have conviction. And I think convictions are good. But you know, there's a lot of people who have convictions that are lost. There's a lot of people that have convictions that are far from God. And I believe that the Jewish people had a lot of convictions. As a matter of fact, those Jewish people, if you look at them, they said the most conservative people on the face of the planet. And boy, did they have conviction. Matter of fact, you couldn't even carry a bed on the Sabbath day. They had so much convictions. And they had many rules and regulations. But you know what they lacked? The fruit of the Spirit. Their attitudes were not good. As a matter of fact, there was a day when Jesus was teaching there in the open courtyard in the temple and these Jewish leaders brought a woman taken in adultery <clears throat> and uh, they brought, him to, brought her to Jesus and said, what do we do? You know, Moses said that we should stone this woman. What do you say, Jesus? And of course, you know the story. He, he stoops down and writes with his finger in the, in the ground and they keep asking him and finally he stands up and he says to them, you know, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. I'm gonna uphold the law, but let's make sure that you're prepared to do the judgment. If you don't have any sin in your own life, you cast the first stone. Of course, the Bible says they went out one by one and, and uh, left Jesus alone with the woman there. But you know, one thing that's interesting in that story is that these Jews had convictions. These Jews believed that adultery was sin. And they came and they, they brought this woman. They didn't like the fact that this woman was living in adultery. And, and they had the same convictions, perhaps, that the Lord Jesus had. They both were against adultery. They could have started a church together, couldn't they? No, they couldn't. Do you know why? Because they had a different spirit about them. Oh, my what a different spirit about them. You had the Pharisees who had a conviction against adultery, but they were wanting to destroy the woman. And then you had Jesus who had a conviction against adultery, but he wanted to save the woman. He said, I don't condemn you, I want to save you. And you know, there's a lot of people in the church today that have these convictions, and they're good convictions, but their spirit is destructive. And boy, do they stand and justify themselves based on their convictions. But you know, what's really, what God is really looking for is he's looking for that attitude. He's looking for the fruit of that spirit. He's looking for the love that comes out of that heart. You know, lost people can have convictions. I know some lost people that don't celebrate Christmas. They have conviction. I know lost people that have uh, convictions against abortion. I meet them on the campuses. There's a lot of people who are conservative, who have many convictions and do the right things in many ways, but they don't have the Spirit of God in their heart. And they don't have the fruits of the Spirit. And so there's a lot of people like in, the, in, in Jesus' day here that, that had an appearance of what looked to be religion, but they did not have the fruit of the Spirit or the fruit of those things that are coming out of the heart. 
Mark chapter 11. Let's go back, back there here. Excuse me, Mark chapter 11 again. So coming out of the heart, these attitudes, the Lord is looking for fruit. Attitudes are important to God. I believe many people have convictions, but they have an attitude problem. And uh, they have, in the ministry I've seen this, their attitude just stinks to heaven. And there's probably people in here that have an attitude problem, and, and they're arrogant. You know, their convictions are so, and they put themselves above others. That's pride, isn't it? It's arrogance. The Bible says we're to consider others better than ourselves, putting other people above ourselves and not putting them down. The Pharisee looked down upon that uh, sinner and despised him. And I believe that Pharisee had a lot of convictions. But he was an arrogant individual. People are critical. Critical. You know, God has made a way, I told you this a few nights ago, to, to avoid criticism. And that is to love people. I mean, if someone does something wrong, someone doesn't dress the way you like, go to them and, and talk with them and, and go to them alone, right? And love them. Love them. You know, hatred is, is talking about them to someone else. And so it's, it's, it's love. Many people have a critical spirit. Many people are comparing uh, themselves to others. Many people are in competition. Boy, I, I remember uh, many years ago, someone preached a message here about competition, sports competition, and, and I agreed with that. You know, we shouldn't be out competing in volleyball and sports and f- trying to win, and this competition, this spirit of I'm better than you and my team is better than you, but you know, I see a lot of that in a lot of Christians in other areas, in religion. My family is better than yours. Our church is more holy than yours. And, and all this competition going on amongst God's people. Division and strife. And so I know a lot of people have convictions, and, and I have convictions. But I tell you what, and you know this is to be the truth. You can have convictions, but you know your heart can be far from God with all your convictions. I mean, convictions are something you build oftentimes in your mind, and maybe you've had a conviction all these years, maybe you were taught a certain conviction, and you'll carry that conviction, but you can be as far from God with convictions as any Pharisee was. But the fruit of the Spirit requires you to be right with God and walking in His Spirit. And so when the Lord is looking for something real, yes, he loves convictions. But convictions can be deceiving. He's looking for fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit, attitudes, is what he came to that tree looking for in Israel. Fruit. So a lot of religion can have conviction but can have no heart, a form, an appearance but uh, nothing that means anything to the Lord. I'll tell you a a funny story. I read uh, a woman who had a heart for God, and uh, every morning she was up praying, seeking the face of God, spent an hour or so in in prayer. She loved the Lord, seeking the Lord, and she had a cat, and that cat would bother her and purr and rub up against her, and so she, each morning she would have her quiet time with the Lord, she would take that cat and tie it to the bedpost so she could have her quiet time with the Lord. Well, she had a daughter, and the next generation came along, and that daughter didn't have quite the heart that she had, but the daughter spent five or ten minutes in in devotions in the morning, and she also had a cat, and since her mother did what she did, she also tied her cat to the bedpost while she had devotion. She saw her mother do it all this time, and so she tied her cat to the bedpost. Well, this, this daughter also, next generation, had another child, a little girl, and that girl grew up, and, and guess what? She didn't have any conviction at all, had no heart for God, but every morning she tied her cat to the, to the bedpost too, without any heart at all but following tradition, following the way it's always been. And so that's, that's reality. And uh, the Jewish people were very much stooped in tradition, and uh, yet they did not have a heart. Now let's come down here because 
the Lord is going to, to talk about this sacred and secular thing starting in verse number 15. And here's what, he, here's what it says. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, is, not, is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now what's provoking here the Lord? And I believe it's tied in here to this fig tree. What is provoking the Lord in causing him to respond in this way? And that's the message for us tonight. And I want to share with you what, what's provoking God here in the nation of Israel. Here's something that's, that's happening. This house, my house, shall be called of all nations the house of prayer. This house is a sacred place. This house has been consecrated. In the Old Testament, this house has been sanctified as a, as a house of God, a house of prayer. God has set this house aside. There were many houses in Israel in those days, but this house was set apart as a sacred house, and that house was to be used, Jesus said, as a house of prayer. Now, if you would have gone into that house, you'd have seen a lot of furniture. You'd have seen a lot of uh, different articles. Uh, uh, and all of those pieces and furniture and articles were sanctified. As a matter of fact, Moses talked about how the, the temple and all the furniture and, and all those things were sprinkled with blood and, and they were separated from that which was common. And they were sanctified and made sacred. For example, this, this pulpit. This pulpit could, could be used anywhere. You could make pulpits and use them anywhere. And uh, however, if, if they brought this pulpit into the house of God in the Old Testament and wanted to use this pulpit in the house of God, it would be a sanctified pulpit, a consecrated pulpit. It would be the Lord's pulpit. And they would anoint it, sprinkle blood on it, and it would be sacred, sanctified, more than any other pulpit. For example, a loaf of bread. A loaf of bread was common in Israel, but you put that loaf of bread on the table of showbread. That loaf of bread is now a sanctified loaf. It's a sacred loaf. And anybody come outside of the priests and try to eat that loaf, they're going to be in trouble with the Lord. Any other loaf they want to eat is fine because those other loaves are common. But there are certain things that are sanctified, certain things that are sacred. And so the house of God here was a place that was sacred. It was set apart for God. As a matter of fact, in verse 17, it says, Jesus says, Is it not written, My house, my house shall be called a house of prayer. It is the Lord's. It has been separated for him. Men build it, but they sanctified it, and they consecrated it to him, and it became his house. And so when you defile his house, he gets upset. And uh, the Lord shows his concern here about what they're doing in his house. So sacred, I want you to think about this, sacred. Sacred is that which maybe was common, a loaf of bread, a piece of furniture, but it's brought into the house of God and it's sanctified and it's, this is your, this is your bread now, Lord. This is your piece of furniture. This is your house. It is sanctified and sacred for your purposes. And then I, I use this word secular or, or we would use the word common. Um, something that's secular was for common use. Anyone could use it. Uh, bread, you go to Walmart, you can buy a loaf of bread and you can eat it. Just don't eat the bread on the, sh on the table of showbread. You could buy a piece of furniture and use it. If you wanted to, you could destroy it. But when you're talking about the furniture that was sanctified, 
and sacred in the house of God, it was something far different. And so the house of God was, was a special place. The furniture in it was the Lord's furniture, the food, the candlestick, everything that was in the house of God was sacred. It was special. And the reason why it was special is because it was offered up to the Lord. It's yours. And so God took possession of it. And so here in verse 17, the house, this house is the Lord's house. And the Lord was wanting to use it as a house of prayer, but the Israelites had made it a den of thieves. They had turned it into a secular house. They had not regarded the fact that it was a sacred place, but they turned it into something that was secular. And I believe all the feasts, I think if you had gone back in Israel in those days, the Passover feast was not something that was sacred anymore. It was simply a time of family reunion, a time for the cousins to get together uh, and uh, went through a bunch of formal things, but it was more a time maybe to meet business associates and, and uh, it had lost its purpose. This, this sacred day, these sacred feasts had become secular, had become common. And, and we know a little bit about that, don't we? Has Christmas become secular? Yes, it has. And I, I know that we don't believe that Jesus, you know, was born probably in December, but, but it used to be in America that, that Christmas was a sacred holiday, that it was a special holiday that honored the Lord. It was, it was the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And throughout my lifetime, there's been a lot of pressure to turn that sacred day into a, a secular day. And it's certainly become a secular holiday. Now, my children sometimes have asked me over, over the course of my life, Christmas is coming up here, Dad, why don't we have Christmas trees and why don't we have uh, presents and do all the things that, that everybody else does? And, and I respond this way to them uh, in the same way I'm teaching here today that, that I don't want to get involved in a, in a day, especially a day that once was a sacred day in America, once was a day that honored the Lord Jesus, and get involved in the secular aspect of it. And everybody else in the world has a Christmas tree. Everybody else in the world puts lights up outside their house. Everybody else in the world exchanges gifts. And it's common. As a matter of fact, people do it, they don't even believe in Jesus. Go all over the world, you find people celebrating Christmas. It's lost its, its purpose. It's lost its sacredness. And so I encourage my children, why participate in something that is, that is moving away from sacred to something that is moving into secularism? Or if you want to celebrate Christmas, take it back to where it is a sacred time. Of, of worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ and, and giving him gifts instead of giving one another gifts. And so throughout the Bible, you see people who take something that is sacred and turn it into something that is secular, and God brings judgment upon them. I think of the uh, Lord's Supper, a very sacred time, and the bread and the wine there in 1 Corinthians 11, and, and this church turned this sacred event into a, into a sec secular free-for-all, into a drunken feast, and, and God came and started to judge them because they had taken something that was his, the Lord's Supper, a sacred thing, and made it something that was secular. You know, I think of Esau was very much, uh, Esau was a profane man. It says that he took something that was very sacred and he profaned it and made it very secular, very common. That birthright was a, a sacred thing for a Jewish firstborn and uh, he despised it. He basically took something sacred and said it's just common. It's, it's, I just trade it for a, a bowl of pottage. And uh, obviously the Lord was not pleased with what he did, taking something that was sacred like the birthright and turning it to something that was secular. And, 
And I know we find this, and I'm getting to the main thrust of the message here in a minute, but we find this in churches. It's happening all over the place, and I trust we don't have it here, but churches are becoming secular institutions. We have bingo parlors in churches now. We have uh, gymnasiums in churches and, and workout places in churches and basketball courts in churches and even Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks are moving into churches and, and the secular world is starting to inundate the church house. And the house of prayer is now becoming a house of merchandise. And you know who's behind all that? You know, the devil's trying to remove everything sacred from our society. And uh, he's doing a good job of it, unfortunately. But this has happened throughout history. And I give you some examples of the Jewish people. And then we'll look at some of our examples that we deal with in, in our life here presently. But two examples of the Jewish people, they're they're examples that brought judgment upon the nation of Israel because of a sacred thing being turned secular. And I think, first of all, the Sabbath, the Sabbath day in, in Genesis chapter two, God had a day, it was his day, it was a sacred day. In Genesis two, verse one, it says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work, work which God created and made. And so here the Lord says, I'm going to set aside a day and I'm going to sanctify it or make it a holy day, a sacred day. Actually, Isaiah 58 says, this is my holy day. You other, the other six days, you can have them. <laughs> Those are your days. Those are man's days. But my day is sacred. And it's, it's holy. And he sanctified it. He called it my holy day just like Jesus said, this is my house, my holy day. And so God sanctified the Sabbath. Exodus 20, verse 11 says, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He made it holy. This is a special day. It's the Lord's day. It's not man's day. And so he set it apart as a sacred day. And so six days were common. Six days were man's day. They could do whatever they wanted. Do your business on those six days. But the one day God had established as a sacred day. And you know what happened in the Old Testament. When a man went out into the field and picked up sticks on the Sabbath day, he was severely judged for it, wasn't he? Judgment was brought upon him. And, uh, you know, what's the problem? He's just out doing some work on sun or Saturday. What's the issue? Well, you're defiling my sacred day. You're making it a, a common day, a secular day. And so God brought judgment upon him. When the Lord rained manna down from heaven, he gave it for six days. But nothing came down on the seventh day because the Lord said, that's my day and nobody's gonna do any work on, on the Sabbath day. And so just think about that for a minute. God, in the Old Testament, he said, I have a, a sacred day, and that sacred day is the Sabbath day, one day out of seven. Boy, this shows you how sinful humanity is, and especially those in the Old Testament, but I think we face the same thing today. God says to humanity, think about this, he did this in the garden, all the trees of the garden, you can have them. Just give me one tree. This tree is my tree, and I don't want you to touch this tree, but everything else, you can have it. What did man do? You gotta, gotta have this one. Now God says, give me one day. You know, some people think God's mean, and he's an ogre, and he's always angry, and, and uh, he's asking too much. But yet the Lord says, I'm gonna give you six days and you can do your, your business, do your pleasure. Just give me one day. 
at my sacred day. I want you to honor me on this Sabbath day. And you know what happened throughout the the entire Old Testament? Israel would not give one out of the seven. They struggled with giving one out of seven. Can you imagine someone coming to you and saying, here is seven pieces of candy, children. I'm going to give you six, and I'll keep one. And then the child saying, I want that one too. You parents would say, my, that's selfish. You know, God did the same thing for humanity, and humanity said, I want that one too. And you know, the law was given to show us how wicked we really are. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. And so you have the story of Nehemiah, and you know, Nehemiah's up there on the wall looking down, and He's, he's, a, he's a man that honors God and wants to keep the Sabbath a sacred day and he's got these people outside the gate there wanting to get in to sell their goods. And he gets angry at them and he says to them, basically, I'm gonna come down and lay my hands on you all. And it wasn't an ordination service, was it? He must have been a pretty rough fella, but he was upset. Here Jesus is upset too. He's going through the... the uh, His house, he's turning the tables over. It's kind of like Nehemiah's. This is stirring me up that my house, my house that was dedicated for a sacred purpose, the house of prayer, you have turned it into a den of thieves. You have turned it into a place of merchandise. And so we have this long history of humanity taking that which is sacred and turning it into something that is secular. And by the way, maybe you knew this, but the Babylonian captivity, the the many years the Israelites spent in captivity in Babylon was because they did this very thing. They took the the sacred, the Sabbath, and, and turned it into a secular day. And they disregarded the truth that the Lord had established it as a sacred day. By the way, I did some study in history. I don't don't know if maybe you've studied the Pharisees, but the whole Pharisaical movement that Jesus faced came out of the Babylonian captivity. And uh, they came out of that, you would probably do the same thing. They came out of that captivity and they said, boy, we're never going to mess up the Sabbath again. And they began to really go way beyond the spirit of the law of the Sabbath and uh, build a huge fence around the Sabbath with all these regulations. But that was out of their desire not to go back into captivity. We're not going to make that mistake again. Now let me ask you a question here because I think this is important for us. This is the law. And just to ask you this, can you give God one day out of seven? You know, I find that I know we don't, we don't support the idea of the Sabbath and all that, but I believe in the New Testament we're under grace. Amen? And the truth of the matter is we ought to give him every, every day. Every day is a sacred day. But I find that people have a hard time even giving the Lord one day out of seven now. And yet they say they're under the grace of God. I know as a young boy, I sat in church. We occasionally went to the Presbyterian church. I was sitting in church drawing golf courses on the paper with a pencil there in the pew, uh, doing all kinds of unusual things, and I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to give God. I I didn't understand it back then, but I was a self-centered individual, had no desire to give God any time, let alone one solid day. But let me ask you this. First of all, are you able to give God one day out of seven and sanctify it and make it sacred? You know, you don't have to bring your cell phone to church. You don't have to leave church and go out and play something. You don't have to get back to your pleasures in the afternoon, Sunday afternoon, but you give one day 
to him. At least one. I think you ought to give him seven. I mean, I think you ought to just make every day a sacred day, but, but I'm just concerned that we're at this point uh, not even giving the Lord the one day that the law requires. And I know we should be much higher than that. How about this one? Here's another area they made a mistake. The Jews did tithing. Tithing was a sacred thing. God said, the tenth is mine. My house, my day, my 10%, my tithe. And he told the nation of Israel, you can keep nine out of 10. Boy, isn't God generous? Nine out of 10, you can have it all, but I want one-tenth. It's called the tithe in the Bible. I wonder how many people actually give a tenth here to God. That's interesting. Can't it come up to the law yet? A tenth. But they were required, and God asked them to to give him a tenth. Malachi 3.8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? How do you rob God? Well, here's how you rob God. God says the tenth is mine. And when you keep the tenth, you're keeping my money. And so that's called robbery or it's stealing from the Lord. Now, I don't believe that we're under the law anymore and we're not under the Sabbath, we're not under the, the, the tithe, and there's the word tithe, except maybe in the book of Hebrews, is not a New Testament concept, but when God gets a hold of the heart in the new covenant, it ought to be this way, 10%? I want to give God 50%. Amen. The heart is in love with the Lord Jesus, and, and 10% is, is, is very, very small. And so what happens is when the, and I see this when I'm going through the book of Acts, when the Spirit of God falls upon the people there in the book of Acts, no 10% stuff at all. It's let's just give it all. And they're generous givers and they're hilarious givers and, and they just release their hands off of their possessions and their money and they say, you know, we're just going to be uh, generous and, and give. And you know, that's the kind of heart the Lord's looking for today. And I get concerned, you know, uh, we're not even 10%, and even that 10% is grudging, grudging. Do I have to give? You know, you look at that paycheck and you pull out 10%. Do I have to come this far? Well, friends, that's the law. God bless those people that do it, and I'm in charge of our finances at home. And I count the money, but, you know, maybe someone makes $386.27 in their paycheck and they write a check for $38.26. Just to the penny, 10%. Is that the kind of giving that the Lord is wanting from us? Or are we supposed to be a generous giver? And so 10% is sacred it's God's. Now, I know we're going to move into the New Testament here, um, and we're going to go much higher than 10%. But look back here at Mark again, and I'd like to move us into the New Testament because there are some sacred things for us to consider here. In Mark chapter 11, in verse 17, it says, And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So here we are in the Old Testament, and uh, we've already talked about the fact that the people of God are very similar to the people of God today when we approach the second coming of Christ. And in those days, the people of God worshiped with their lips, but their heart was far from them. The people of God had no real fruit. Jesus came to the fig tree. There was a lot of leaves, but no fruit. 
And I wonder today if, you know, we're very similar to, to those Jews. We have a lot of leaves, and yet there's lacking in the fruit. Now let me ask you a question. What is his temple today? Now remember, there was a building in the Old Testament. It's a house of prayer. It's a temple of God. God, it was his house. It was consecrated for him. He lived there with the Shekinah glory. And that is all a picture and a type of something that is new covenant. Can anybody tell me here, what is the house of God today? What is the temple of the living God? I'll read it to you. It's mentioned a number of times in the scriptures, but in 2 Corinthians 6, for you are the temple of the living God. Not a temple made with hands, as this temple was, but you are the temple. Now, I believe this. All those Old Testament types and figures were to teach us New Testament reality and truth. And that Old Testament temple was a picture of you, your body. And I'll even go a little bit farther in saying the temple, the house of God, is also us collectively, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you something tonight. We've talked about his house. We've talked about his holy day. We've talked about his tithe, and you don't want to steal something that's his. But now let's move to us. It's his people. His people. Notice what it says. You are the temple of the living God. I will dwell in them. That's my house. I will walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. My dwelling place. My house. So let's ask this question tonight. If Jesus were to come to the temple, to your house, your mind, your heart, your body, and we as a collective people. What kind of sacred places would he find in you? That's my question for you tonight. What kind of sacred place would he find in you? Now I think about visiting that Old Testament temple And if you were to go to an Old Testament temple in the Old Testament, you'd find that there is scripture reading. You'd find that there's times of teaching and reading the Old Testament. You would find that there would be prayer made. You'd find there would be sacrifices made. You'd find there'd be thanksgiving made. You'd find there'd be singing. We could just go and visit an Old Testament temple. Back in the day when the Lord was there in his Shekinah glory and his fullness and these things would be a part of what's going on in his temple. And so let's, let's look at our temple here for a minute. What's going on in your temple? Are you turning the house of God into a secular place? You know, one of the reasons why the church today is fruitless is because we've turned the house of God into a secular place. And these cell phones have done a lot to do that. Secularism in in, in us, in our hearts. Here's what a good temple ought to look like. There ought to be, and by, by by the way, Colossians chapter three goes down through this list of what's really good for the temple of God Meditating day and night upon his word. Meditation in the temple. Teaching, scripture reading. Having in our hearts the word of God. Prayer. Praying. The Bible talks about praying without ceasing. These things going on in the temple, in you, in your body. Sacrifices, Hebrews 13, 15. We sang the song here this this evening. Offering up the sacrifice of praise continually. You know, if you'd have been in the temple back then, you'd you'd have seen sacrifices going up continually. 
singing, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Let me ask you something. If the Lord visits your temple tonight, you're, you're, you're the house of God, that's, that's your body. Your body is the temple of a living God. What does he see in there? Does he see you uh, mainly with uh, money changers and, and merchandising and the cares of this life? And, and uh, he sees your heart uh, occupied with sports. He sees your heart occupied with the pursuit of money. He walks through the temple of God, the New Testament temple of God, and, and he sees that my house no longer is a sacred place. My house has become a secular place. Our hearts, our minds. Business. That's what they were doing there in the house of God. They were, they were doing their business. They were selling animals. They were money changers. It was what they did and and uh, they were turning the house of God into a, a place of business. I just have a list of things here. There's many things we could, we could mention, but I think sports is a big one. You know, when the Lord walks in the temple, does he find uh, a lot of affection for sports? And uh, he sees a lot of mental time used for sports here. I see in this temple there's a lot of things going on here. And... Uh, Secularism. The Bible talks about the love of money, the pursuit of money. It talks about the cares of this life. Here's another one. It talks about pornography. Pornography. Can you imagine the Lord coming into his temple and seeing immorality you know, it's not unusual in the house of God in the Old Testament that uh, abominations were taking place in the temple of God. Remember, they cut the hole through the wall and, and, um, and amazing things that they saw, the wickedness that was going on in that temple. And so when the Lord walks through the temple, your, your body is a temple of the living God, your heart, your mind, What's, what kind of things is he seeing in the temple? Fear, anxiety. I will dwell in them and I will walk in them. That's an amazing statement, isn't it? I'll walk in my people. Just like I walked through the Old Testament temple there in Mark 11, and I threw the tables over, the money changers. I'm gonna walk in you. And my question tonight is, how sacred is the place? How sacred is that place? Or has it been turned into a secular place? And I know my own heart, and I know my heart is very similar to your heart, that it's very easy for us to go through the motions like the Israelites and attend a church and put on the clothes and, and uh, do many things, activities, but also, while we're doing that, have a very secular temple. Things going on there that the Lord is not pleased with. So let me ask you a question here this morning. What is sacred in your life? What is sacred? You know, the house of God was a place where sacred activities were to take place. Not a bunch of secular things. Let's get these things out of here. We'll overthrow the tables. I want to see, this is my house. You're my people. I want to see a sacred place. Let me ask you, what is sacred in your life? I have a couple things to ask here tonight. Is church, is church time a sacred time for you? and your family. Ch church time, when we gather together, is that a sacred time? What about your private devotional life? Is that sacred? You have an hour or so every morning. I have a sacred place in a closet where I meet with God 
and it's a sacred place. How about the family altar? Is the family altar still a sacred place? Or has your home been secularized? Too much going on for a sacred time with the family. You know, the devil's trying to take everything sacred out of your life. Your prayer closet, your family devotions, your church life. Let me ask you this, is any part of your income sacred? What about your daily life? Is it full of that which is sacred? Or has your heart been moved to secularism? Do you meditate day and night in the scriptures? What's going on in the temple? Is there prayer? Is there thanksgiving? Is there singing? Is there praise? Is your heart and mind a sacred place? You know, one of the reasons why when Jesus came to that fig tree and he didn't find any fruit, he found a bunch of religion, a bunch of, of leaves. The reason why he, he did not find any fruit there was because this nation had slowly moved away from being sacred to being a secular nation. And that had affected the house of God, it affected the people of God, and it had caused the nation to be a fruitless nation. So my question tonight for you is this, when the Lord walks through your temple, your imaginations, your heart, your affections, because you now are the temple of the living God, when he walks through that temple, Does he find a sacred place? Or does he find a secular place? A heart full of sports and love of money and the cares of this life and and business and, and all the things that pornography and the list goes on and on. You know, God is calling us to a sacred life. You're a sacred individual. If you're a child of God, you are sanctified. Set apart, you're his. And he has called each one of us to a life of sacredness. And I realize that the devil is, is pushing and he is attempting us to remove sacred things from our life, just like taking away the, per, the meaning of Christmas and other holidays. He has he is caused them to be secular In the very same way, many of your lives are being secularized, little by little. That which was once sacred is no longer a part of your life. That which you valued as being, this is God's time, I'm gonna meet with him every morning, I'm gonna get in his word, is no longer sacred. That family altar is no longer sacred. Church time, Sunday, a sacred day. I think America was much better off when, when Sunday we didn't go out to eat at restaurants and we didn't, uh, we didn't secularize. But that ought to be in our hearts. So I'll close with, with this. Is your heart and mind a sacred place? Is your temple a sacred place this evening? The Lord Jesus is coming again. He came the first time and when he came to his people, he found them in a condition where they were religious, they were conservative, they had conviction, but they had no fruit. And the reason why they had no fruit is because they had turned the sacred into that which was secular. I want to call all of us back to a sacred life. A life that has a lot of sacred things in it. This is my quiet time. It's a sacred time. Nothing interrupts it. 
These are our family devotions. They're sacred. Doesn't matter what comes up, nothing interrupts them. Church time. I don't know how it is here, but it's Sunday. Uh, we don't need to go to church. We can lay in bed. We, we can just do our own thing. It's Sunday. No, this is, this is God's day. This is, this is a sacred time we gather together. If you miss, if you miss anything, uh, miss work or miss your pleasure or miss your sporting event, but don't miss when the children of God come together in the house of God. It's a sacred time. And so, 2,000 years ago, the Lord walked through a temple and he, and he was clearing the, the tables. He says, I don't want this secular stuff in my house. This is my house. This is a sacred place. And so, if you're a child of God tonight, you're also a sacred place. You're the house of God. Your family. Your family is a sacred family. Your church. Listen, everything in this world, and I've watched it over the years, some of you have too, everything that is sacred is being removed and turned secular. The Ten Commandments are gone. Honoring uh, the Lord's Day is gone. Christmas is gone. Easter is gone. I mean, there's so much pressure to remove sacred things, those things that are dedicated to the Lord. And I know also it's affecting our lives. We are also becoming secular in within and we're losing our piousness, our sacredness. <clears throat> so as the Lord considers your temple tonight, what is it that he would like to overthrow? I mean, is it a sports team that you're following? Is it that phone, that social media, what is it that is secularizing you and your heart? I'd like you to just allow him the liberty to come in and say, turn it over and drive it out. Well, let's, let's close tonight. I had a song picked out here. It's a sacred song. It's in your Christian hymn, hymn, hymnary, number 277. And this doesn't happen, sacredness doesn't come to pass without taking time to be holy. Hmm. 277, take time to be holy. Speak off with thy Lord. And this whole song talks about a sacred life. Let's all stand to our feet and we'll sing this song together. And maybe if the Lord is walking through your temple, he sees something he'd like to overturn, why don't you just come up and acknowledge that? And bow your knee and, and ask the Lord to drive it out and forgive you. God, make us a sacred people. Number 277. Take time to be holy. Speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word make friends of God's children